The year was 1854, and the SS Arctic, the fastest passenger liner of its time, set out to cross the Atlantic. As it sailed through the misty veil, it slowly disappeared into the unknown. The Collins Line, an American shipping company, was started in 1818 and only began seriously trading in the transatlantic by 1835. Its steamships crossed the Atlantic from Liverpool to New York within just 10 days. Doesn't sound like a great speed today, I know, but back then, the same thing took other ships several weeks. Light on the water with their wooden hulls, powering through with a strong steam engine, those steamships were the favorite choice for many high-profile people. What could go wrong with such an advanced ship, they thought. This reminds me of some other ship everyone believed to be unsinkable. But anyway, back to the Collins Line. It grew to be a serious contender on transatlantic routes, with only one other competitor, the Cunard's Line. It was a British company also aiming to be the main force through the Arctic Passage. In 1835, the company received a new ship that traveled to Liverpool and came back to New York with the largest cargo ever at that time. From then, the Collins Line was steadily growing. It seemed like there would only be future successes for it. Unfortunately, their lavish ships became costly to run with the amount of coal used. Massive power along with weak wooden hulls meant they needed many repairs after each voyage. So, every trip ended up being expensive. But since the ships were safe and had a great reputation, people were willing to pay the price, and the company was definitely not in crisis. They had achieved something no one had managed to do before them. Like I told you, their ships crossed the Atlantic in a whopping 10 days. And Edward Collins, the owner, was very determined to maintain the pace. Their five ships easily outran the Cunard's line of only three. With this great praise, it provided more attention. Though the Cunard's ships were slower with their iron hulls, they believed there was still profit regardless of how slowly they sailed. Among Collins' ships, the Arctic, the third of them to be launched, was the largest, reaching 284 feet long with two side lever steam engines, each with 1,000 horsepower. The paddle wheels made 16 revolutions a minute when at full speed. At the time of its launch, the press called it the most stupendous vessel ever constructed in the United States. But glamour and fame couldn't avoid what would come next. On the 27th of September, the Arctic was on its journey from Liverpool to New York, continuing a speed pace through the thick fog. It's possible that by that moment, after four years of record-breaking trips, the crew became overconfident with their sailing and the ship. Going only 50 miles from Newfoundland, they carelessly continued through the fog with no radio contact, sonar, or any other form of identifying objects, equipped only with Morse code. A smaller ship, the SS Vesta, which operated as a fishing vessel, often worked around Newfoundland. It was passing through the same path as the Arctic and crashed into its side. Shocked by the collision, the captain of the Arctic offered help to the much smaller Vesta, but it was soon clear that the damage that seemed minor on the Arctic was far worse. Beneath the waterline, a hole was letting water into the hull. The cost of the much faster wooden hull now seemed less valuable. They steered toward land, trying to plug the holes, but they weren't doing so well, and the seawater continued to pour in, filling up higher and pushing the ship down. And finally, once the engine room was full, it put out the boilers, taking away the massive power the Arctic was once legendary for. They moved slowly until coming to a complete stop. The ship continued to sink, and the order was to abandon it. At the time, maritime law allowed for the Arctic to carry only six lifeboats, only capable of saving 180 people. The crew and some of the passengers managed to push their way aboard and took most of the seats on those boats. Things were pretty wild, and everyone forgot about their manners, not letting the ladies and the youngest ones board first. It took four hours for the Arctic to sink. 150 crew and 250 passengers were on board. 
those that weren't able to find a lifeboat made a desperate attempt to build their own rafts from parts of the ship. Two days later, only three boats made it safely to the shore. The other three were never found. Believe it or not, the rescue party also saved some people that had been clinging to the wreckage for two days. Unlike the crew, the captain went down with the Arctic, but amazingly survived. He would be only one of 85 people that made it out of the 400 on board. When the news arrived two weeks later, the public responded with great sadness to the losses. Great anger soon followed towards the poor safety measures in the crew. The press published demands to change the laws for more lifeboats. It only made sense to have enough for every person on board a ship. But they ignored those requests. This neglect would lead to more disasters in the future. Enough lifeboats would only come into maritime law some 60 years later, after the disaster of the Titanic. Edward Collins' wife and two children were also aboard the ship and didn't return. He was heartbroken, but didn't stop running his business. The Collins line still had a reputation to uphold, the biggest, fastest, and most luxurious on the Atlantic. Edward Collins would now build an even better ship than any other. It was named the Adriatic, and it was the largest ship in the world, 354 feet long. With two alternating steam engines that had never been built of this size, these steam engines at the time were at the height of engineering, though today you can only see them in models and toys. With the new addition of two masts, the Adriatic would also be able to sail if needed. Luckily, they made some lessons from the disaster of the Arctic. But before their new ship, the Adriatic, was built, another disaster had occurred. The sister ship of the Arctic had also sunk. They believe this second ship was desperate to stay in front of the Cunard's line and hit an iceberg somewhere during the race. This weird contest took the lives of 141 people. The desperation of Collins and his weakly built hulls pushed the company towards bankruptcy in 1858. The newly built Adriatic, costing over $1 million, had only made one voyage in the end. And even that voyage was considered a disaster. The ship collided with a tugboat. It still managed to finish its maiden voyage at a suitable time. After the company had gone bankrupt, they had to sell the ship for only $50,000. They removed the great giant engines, replacing them with only sails. Although it was once the greatest ship on the high seas, it was only 30 years later until it was abandoned labeled irreparable and anchored in a river. The other remaining ships were also sold and only used for parts. Edward Collins left the industry altogether, seeking work on dry land instead. As the Collins line was no longer in the mix, the Cunards would grow in strength. Without competition, they would win the Blue Ribbon for the next 30 years and 180 years later, after producing hundreds of ships. They still have a constant presence on the seas as they provide transatlantic crossings, world voyages, and leisure cruises. To this day, the Cunard Line is the only one to run ships between Europe and America, and it's great proof that it's not always the fastest that's the best. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. They say nothing is ever lost. And it's true. Let's discover ships frozen in time. The first one is truly fascinating. Here, the Antikytheria shipwreck. It's a Greek trading ship from the first century BCE. It's located on the east side of the Greek island of Antikythera and at the merging point of the Aegean and Mediterranean seas. Around 2,000 years later, in 1900, a group of Greek sponge divers discovered the wreck. They were going to Tunisia, yet they were forced to find shelter from a storm on a nearby island. Since they couldn't go anywhere due to the storm, they decided to look for sponges until the weather got calmer. One of the divers discovered the shipwreck at depths of around 130 feet, 
Imagine someone going for a sponge hunt, but getting out to the surface with archaeological treasures. The captain of the sponge boat talked to the Greek officials about what they had found. The officials sent two ships to the wreckage. The salvage operation was successful and discoveries are now in Greece's National Archaeological Museum in Athens. The findings included three life-sized marble horses, jewelry, coins, and hundreds of works of art, including a seven-foot-tall colossus statue of Hercules. Among these treasures, Antikythera of Phoebe, a bronze statue of a young man, caught more attention. Because the Ephebe doesn't comply with any familiar iconographic model, and there are no known copies of his type, he held a spherical object in his hand. Scholars have different theories of who that person could be, but they are not in a consensus yet. More than 70 years later, Jacques-Yves Cousteau and his team went to the area and recovered hundreds more artifacts and the remains of four people. Interestingly, they discovered a complex set of interlocking gears, capable of predicting the movement of the sun, moon, and several planets. The mechanism can also show the times of solar and lunar eclipses years into the future. Think of this Antikythera mechanism as an early computer calendar, you know, to plan significant events like agricultural activities, religious rituals, and Olympic games. These artifacts found in the Antikythera wreckage are some of the most important findings in modern archaeology. Just the Antikythera mechanism itself has changed our perception of the limits of ancient technology. The mechanism has a sophisticated design and was made over a thousand years ago. After all these amazing discoveries, experts believe that the wreckage site has remained largely unexplored and is mostly because of its location and the landscape of the seafloor on which the ship rests. The wreck is too deep for scuba divers but too shallow to use something like a submersible. A survey made on the seafloor in 2012 showed evidence of a second wreck about 800 feet to the south. It's clear that this area has a lot to offer humanity. What would happen if those sponge hunters didn't go to the area? Scientists found a shipwreck in Antarctica at the bottom of the Weddell Sea 107 years after it sank. The name of the ship was Endurance, and it was the lost vessel of Antarctic explorer Sir Ernest Shackleton. Scientists who laid eyes on it decades later say it is among the greatest undiscovered shipwrecks ever. That is why they filmed the whole discovery. The video shows the remains of the Endurance and proves it is still in remarkable condition. It has been sitting in 10,000 feet of water for over a century, yet it looks like it sank very recently. So the story goes like this. The ship was crushed by ice and sank in 1915. Shackleton and his crewmates had to escape by themselves in small lifeboats. From then on, it was all about survival. Shackleton imagined to get his crew to safety. Then the ship sank. Yes, this is a pretty impressive story. But why did scientists prize this ship? Firstly, Shackleton's Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition sailed to make the first land crossing of Antarctica. Yes, the crew was trapped in ice, but the intention was important. Secondly, it's about the challenge itself of finding the shipwreck. The Weddell Sea is almost always covered in thick sea ice. You know, the same ice that made the Endurance sink. Getting near the presumed sinking location is super hard, let alone being able to conduct research. Experts of the modern expedition team foresaw the time when the lowest extent of Antarctic sea ice would come using satellite images. They realized that the weather was in their favor to start an expedition. Dr. John Shears said that they have successfully completed the world's most difficult shipwreck search, fighting against constantly shifting sea ice, blizzards, and temperatures decreasing to negative 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeesh, I can't imagine the worst conditions in Antarctica if these conditions are in their favor. Lastly, look at this. It's timbers. They're very much intact. Plus, you can read the ship's name. It's still visible. Marine archaeologist Menson Bound says that this is the finest wooden shipwreck he has ever discovered. He has 50 years of career experience, so I believe the guy. So how come the wood is not rotten? Dr. Michelle Taylor, a deep-sea polar biologist, said that there has been little wood deterioration because the wood-munching animals are not in this forest-free region of Antarctica. Workers of a coal mine in East Serbia discovered three shipwrecks that had been there for at least 1,300 years. The largest shipwreck is an ancient Roman fleet. It's around 50 feet long with a flat bottom. It's estimated that the ship could carry a crew of 30 to 35 people. 
Looking at its hull, you can see the marks of repairs. Wow, this one had a lengthy career. You know, it gives us insight into more than a thousand years ago. The two smaller vessels, on the other hand, match descriptions of boats used by Slavic groups to attack the Roman frontier. These two have been discovered under mud and clay in an ancient riverbed. Apparently, in those times, there was a Roman base in a place called Viminasium City. Interestingly, Viminasium was a provincial capital with an estimated 40,000 inhabitants in the 4th century CE. For comparison, it was even larger than Pompeii. The Kostelach coal mine is a center of hidden gems. Archaeologists had found evidence of ancient human and animal activity here before. For instance, in 2012, experts found bones of at least five woolly mammoths, which went extinct about 10,000 years ago. Canadian archaeologists found a ship 150 years after it went missing in the Canadian Arctic waters. This merchant ship is called HMS Investigator. It was purchased in 1848 to search for the explorer Sir John Franklin's ship that got lost in the Northwest Passage expedition. So, HMS Investigator left Britain in 1850 for this rescue operation. The expedition crew, captained by Robert McClure, sailed the Investigator into the water. He realized that he was in the final leg of the Northwest Passage, the sea route across North America. But before he could sail into the Beaufort Sea, the 122-ton ship itself got stuck in the thick ice. The crew spent the winter over the Prince of Wales Strait. The following summer, McClure tried again to sail to the end of the passage, but the ice blocked his way once more. Here, too, the crew was forced to leave the ship. He steered the crew into the Bay of Mercy. There, they were to remain until 1853 when the crew of the HMS Resolute rescued them. Imagine a crew of 60 people who had to spend three winters in the Arctic without even knowing if they would survive. Later on, the ship was found sitting upright in about 36 feet of water. It was in very good condition. Arctic water has prevented the outer deck of the vessel from deteriorating quickly. The outline of the ship and its timber can be clearly seen. Plus, archaeologists have uncovered artifacts on land left by the sailors. They had unloaded everything before abandoning the investigator. Three sailor graves and one British naval shipwreck had also been discovered in the area. I wonder what else they could find there. Wow, it's the only place where one minute you're learning 17 natural ways how to get rid of houseflies, and the next, you're taking an epic journey straight into a black hole. More than 10 billion, with a B, views in total. That's 47 billion minutes watched, or more than 70,000 years. That's all the way back to the Ice Age. Mm, no, I wasn't around then. 40,000 videos, hundreds of topics, and most importantly you, a whole 44 million of you. Our viewers, we could populate an entire country if we wanted to. We'd like to continue helping you learn and giving you useful skill improvement tips. Got a thirst for knowledge? We've prepared four masterclasses on creating a 2D character animation from scratch, 10 hours of video lessons, practical tasks using professional software, and additional materials that you can use with your own projects. Get the full course now and create your own animated masterpiece. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Hello, brave visitor, and welcome to the exhibition of the uncanny. But beware, this is going to be one chilling experience for you. Even Sabrina the Witch couldn't handle these photos. Now, if you've got what it takes to jump into the tunnel of oddities, let's begin. The first photo will take you back to 1900s Belfast. It shows 15 females who were workers at a linen mill. If you calculate how many hands 15 people have, it makes 30, right? But take a good look at the photo, and you'll see there's an extra hand that doesn't belong to any of the ladies there. All the women are arranged in rows with their arms crossed over their chests and hands tucked underneath their arms. There is only one exception to that and it's the lady in the second row with one hand on her hip and the other down by her side. That's one little rebel you got there. But the mysterious claw-like hand is neither hers nor does it belong to someone close to her. It's actually resting on the shoulder of a girl on the other side of the same row. 
and there's no one else who the hand could belong to. <laughs> Even though it's a century old, the photograph first appeared on the internet on April 29, 2016. It was sent to one website by a woman named Linda, who identified the girl with a hand on her shoulder as her grandmother, Ellen Donnelly. But she never commented on who that hand might belong to. What's even weirder is that there's no evidence whatsoever that suggests that the photo was digitally altered. So where did this lonely hand come from? Photoshop didn't exist back then. But this doesn't mean photographers didn't have the necessary skills to edit their photos. Although it was not possible to add an extra hand to the photo, it was surely possible to remove any unwanted objects or people by simply cutting them out with scissors. Photographers would then draw what they wanted to be in the picture in pencil or charcoal. They could also combine multiple negatives to create a single image. There's one more answer to where the hand could have come from. Even though instantaneous photography had already existed in the 1900s, some photographers still use the long exposure technique to capture the moment. So it is possible that while the photo was being taken, the lady in the back initially placed her hands on Ellen and then decided to cross her arms, which makes this terrifying photo the result of long camera exposure. So you can ease your mind that it was not Thing, the hand that lived with the Adams family, that photobombed this picture. Now in our second photo, you'll see a young lady holding a glowing apparition between her hands. It might also make it easy for you to believe that magic is real. But sorry to disappoint you, because that is not the Expellerama spell she's doing. The woman in the photo is French-born Martha Beron who later changed her name to Eva Carrera. She lived between 1886 and 1943. She was a fraudulent medium. She claimed to have psychic abilities that allowed her to communicate with people who had passed over to the other side and make their spirits materialize during her seances. At the time, such lying mediums would follow a standard procedure during their seances. They would enter a closet installed in the room to pretend to concentrate. Then, they could use their powers at full capacity to generate ectoplasm. When not used in the context of cell biology, ectoplasm is a term referring to an imaginary substance that would come out of the body of the medium. It then might take the shape of a face, a hand, or even the entire body of the person who is being called back to life. Eva Carrera was one of those dishonest mediums who would use chewed paper and cut out faces from magazines and newspapers to make fake ectoplasm. This photo of hers, taken in 1912 by German parapsychological researcher Albert von schrenk nosing shows her in action during one of such deceptive seances. But knowing the full story doesn't change the fact that this photo can make your hair stand on end. But what's even more unbelievable than the photo itself is the fact that she was able to convince big names like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes mystery series, that she was the real thing. But you'll be happy to know that she couldn't trick illusionist and escape artist Harry Houdini, who, unlike Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, thought her performances were nothing more than a magician's tricks. Now, these owls in the third photo are not Hogwarts owls, and they are not here to bring you your acceptance letter. This photo was taken in the 1920s outside the Manchester Grammar School, which was founded all the way back in 1515 by a man named Hugh Oldham. And he is the reason why these people are wearing weird owl costumes as they're marching. Hugh Oldham was born in Manchester. He wasn't a serious scholar, despite attending both Oxford and Cambridge universities, while well, the tuition was cheaper then. However, he was in royal service, and thanks to his administrative skills, he was favored with important titles. That is what actually helped him reach high positions and become a powerful and influential figure. And through his new duties, he was able to achieve great wealth, which he later used to fund the school. The motto of Oldham's school, which is written on its coat of arms, is the Latin phrase sapere ode, which loosely translates to dare to be wise. 
To this day, the school still has that same motto, but the choice of the owl doesn't symbolize wisdom as you might think. The owl on the Manchester Grammar School's badge is carrying a banner with the word dome on it. If you read it as one would read emojis, you would arrive at Owldom, which is actually a reference to Hugh Oldham. When you look at the crest of the town of Oldham, you'll see it's very similar to that of the school. This choice was made to reflect the pronunciation of Oldham in the local accent, which is Owldom. Accordingly, paying respects to their founding father is why both the school's and the town's mascot is the owl. So rest assured that nothing sinister and spooky is going on in this photo. Now, how about something sweet after all that eerie stuff? The fourth photo depicts an innocent child whose eyes are screaming, help me! But don't worry, the boogeyman is not the one holding him. The thing he seems to be sitting on is actually his mother. This is called hidden mother photography, and it was actually very common in the Victorian era. Back in the 1840s, the only way people could have their photos taken was with a daguerreotype camera, which was the first photographic camera developed for commercial use. These cameras had exposure times from tens of seconds to several minutes. So one had to stay perfectly still during all that time to get a clear picture. But as you can imagine, it's not easy for a child, let alone me, to stay motionless for such a long period of time. And you can't say, strike a pose to a baby either. So this is the reason why the hidden mother technique was born. Children would be photographed with their mothers present. But mommy would also have to be hidden within the frame. To achieve that, they would often stand behind curtains, under cloaks or blankets, or act as chairs. Sometimes photographers would also remove parts of photographs where moms were visible. Wow, the hardships mothers have to go through for their children. Boy, that hasn't changed. Some of the photos turned out quite well, but some of them ended up looking nightmarish. This practice continued to be used up until the 1920s. But as cameras became faster, there was no need for moms to hide anywhere. At least until photobombing became a thing. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. At the beginning of the 20th century, somewhere off the coast of West Africa, a German steamship was leaving the port. Suddenly, the weather got worse and the vessel entered a thick fog. The sailors ran aground on a sandbank close to the shore. Luckily, no one was hurt, and they were even able to save their precious cargo. But the ship was stuck in the sand for good. And it was not alone there. Nearly the entire length of the western coast of Namibia is called Skeleton Coast. If the name sounds scary, that's because it is. This 976-mile-long beach line is among the most dangerous places on Earth. The local Bushmen tribes believe that their supreme deity made this land when it was angry. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to set foot in Namibia in the 15th century. And yep, they didn't like Skeleton Coast either. Portuguese explorers thought this land presented the gates to the underworld. This is the place where the Namib Desert meets the Atlantic Ocean. It might be dangerous, but it's actually beautiful. Plus, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. If Skeleton Coast had a PR manager, they would quit on the first day on the job. The area is not exactly tourist-friendly because of its geography and history. Beneath the sand and the waves, there is a secret ocean currently lurking for unsuspecting sailors. It's called Benguela Current. It flows towards the north along the coast of southern Africa. This part of the Atlantic is rich in marine life, but the current's land neighbor isn't that happy with the deal. This arid climate created the Namib Desert, one of the driest regions on Earth. And that marine life I just mentioned? It's sharks. 11 species of them to be exact. And yes, the great white decides to pop by once in a while. So far, we've got a desert landscape, strong currents, and sharks. Not a place for a beachside resort, definitely. But if someone ends up on Skeleton Coast, 
Will they know they're in danger? Don't worry, they will. The beach is littered with wrecks of all sizes and shapes. If you remember that German ship I mentioned in the very beginning, its massive and rusted stern is now sticking out from the desert sand. There are some 500 wrecks in total scattered along the coast, and it's a mixed crowd, from Portuguese galleons centuries old to ships that ran ashore here in the 21st century. A modern fishing ship called Zela India managed to slip from its tow rope in 2008 and ended up on Skeleton Coast. Okay, it didn't escape on its own, it had some help from the elements. But it's better to be a tourist attraction on a beach than to be broken up for scrap. That's where the trawler was originally going, poor thing. Skeleton Coast's most famous inhabitant, to call it such a place, is the wreck of the Dunedin Star. The British cargo liner ran aground here in 1942. The massive rescue operation that followed reveals why it's so dangerous for sailors to end up here. The rescuers managed to save all of the crew and passengers, but at a heavy price. An aircraft and a tugboat were lost in the process. It took the last of the rescuers a full two months to return home to Cape Town. Why, you might wonder? One look at the map of the region reveals the reason. It's an endless sea of yellow, which is the sand. There are so few roads here, so Skeleton Coast is hard to reach by land. There are also legal obstacles. You need a special permit to drive into the area. But the skeletons in the name of the area don't only refer to ships. They also stand for animal bones. Most of these belong to whales and seals. Many animals have adapted to the area, so lions and hyenas roam the coastline in search of a meal. Yeah, now there are hungry lions as well, as if those sharks weren't enough. Other animals with a temporary residence on Skeleton Coast include elephants, cheetahs, leopards, and giraffes. In 1971, the Namibian authorities established a national park here. But except for surfers, after an adrenaline rush, they don't get many visitors. You can understand why. The Namib Desert is the oldest desert in the world, and it's not very tourist-friendly either. Those who travel to the region should pack sunscreen and a warm winter jacket. A weird combo, right? Well, not so much when you think that during the day, temperatures soar over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, the air temperature drops below freezing. What a climate roller coaster! And that's not the final danger. Yep, there's more. Remember how that German ship got lost in thick fog? Yeah, it wasn't a one-off event. Because of the region's climate, fog shows up frequently. Sailors should cover their ears now, but this fog is actually good for wildlife. This is their only source of water in the Namib Desert. Reptiles and mammals have adapted to the harsh climate. They use as little water as possible. Shifting sands, thick fog, strong currents, lions, and sharks. Not the stuff you would put in a tourist booklet, but Skeleton Coast isn't the only beach on Earth you wouldn't want to spend your vacation on. I will take you to Cape Tribulation in Australia. The area covers some 48 square miles in the northwestern part of the continent. And no, the area is not as dry as Skeleton Coast. It's part of the Daintree Rainforest. You could say that here, it is the rainforest, not the desert that meets the ocean. The beach at Cape Tribulation is straight from a postcard. But looks can be deceiving. Hmm, Australia? Probably sharks. No, crocodiles are out here to get you if you decide to go for a dip in the sea. There are saltwater crocodiles that the locals call salties. Well, that's a cute nickname for such a dangerous reptile. And it's not just them. The wildlife seems to have a beef with visitors. From October to June, the waters around Cape Tribulation are full of box jellyfish. Their venom affects the human cardiovascular system. When touched by a jellyfish out at sea, swimmers won't have enough time to reach land for help. Vinegar helps neutralize the sting, so you might want to keep a spare bottle in your luggage. Crocodiles and jellyfish sound dangerous, but there's one more animal you should look after. It's the wild boar. It might sound funny, but you won't laugh when you're being chased by one of these across the beach. 21 million wild boars live in Australia. They're mostly active at night, making it even more dangerous if they charge at you. The best defense is running in circles. 
wild boars can't cut corners well. That's probably why we don't see many of them taking up careers as race drivers. Cape Tribulation has one last danger installed for you, and it's not an animal. Out here, even the trees are plotting against visitors. The stinging tree got its name for a reason. If you try to pick one of its beautiful red berries, it'll fight back. Its prickles are like tiny glass shards. The less than pleasant effect on your skin will last for a month. Then there is this wait a while bush. Who keeps naming them like this? This long vine has spikes that grab hold and just don't let go. They are so strong they can pull a human off a horse. You'll have to wait for someone to come by and save you from this thorny grabber. If you are about to cross this Australian beach from the vacation list, hold on for a second. Tourism is booming here. The local authorities have restricted access to all of the danger zones. Visitors go swimming in dreamy water holes that are surrounded by lush vegetation. There are even ropes to swing from. Now that's a beach you can finally relax on. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Thick fog is rising over the ocean as the sun is slowly sinking towards the horizon. It's hard to see further away than a few dozen feet, but that's enough to notice a hulking, skeletal shape in the distance. As your ship approaches the figure, your heart beats faster, and then you make out the details of another vessel, abandoned by the looks of it. Ghost ships do exist, and their mysteries aren't always solved. Take MV Hoyita, for example. It was a wooden vessel built in 1931 as a luxury yacht. It had served well to various people over 20 years before it was bought by a Samoan sailor and became a merchant ship. In 1955, though, Hoyita's service came to an abrupt and mysterious end. On October 3rd, it set sail for another trading voyage that should have taken no more than 48 hours. Delays happen in the sea, so when Hoyita didn't arrive on October 5th as scheduled, there was little worry yet, but then it failed to come on the following day too. There was no distress signal or any other sign of Hoyita's presence anywhere between its departure and arrival points. A search and rescue party was dispatched to find the ship, and for six days, they were scouting the area of nearly 100,000 square miles. On October 12th, the mission returned to the base empty-handed. Hoyita vanished without a trace. It was only a month later that another merchant ship, Tuvalu, noticed the missing vessel far away from its route, drifting in the open sea and listing heavily. The sailors boarded the ship and found that all of its crew and passengers, 25 people total, were missing along with all the cargo the vessel had been carrying. The radio was tuned to the International Distress Channel, meaning that the crew had been trying to ask for help, but they couldn't reach anyone because the radio cable had been damaged limiting the range to two miles. The lifeboats were missing as well, indicating that people on board must have left the ship. Unfortunately, they seemed to have taken the logbook with them, leaving the rescue team clueless as to what had happened. Even today, the mystery of MV Hoyita hasn't been solved yet. No one knows where the crew and passengers had gone and what had caused them to leave. SV Carol A. Deering wasn't a ghost ship in the usual sense of the word. There are no sightings of it in the open sea. Instead, it was found on the shore. But the circumstances of it running aground are a puzzle shrouded in mystery. Carol A. Deering was built in 1919 in Maine, and it was a large vessel made for commercial voyages. Unfortunately, despite its large cost of construction, it had only served for a year before its last trip. July 19, 1920. The ship was traveling from Puerto Rico to Rio de Janeiro via Newport News to deliver a cargo of coal. It was almost halfway to the final destination when the captain felt seriously ill, and the crew turned back to drop him and his son off and replace the captain. The voyage went without incident, but when it came to Barbados in December to resupply, there were strange moods among the crew. The first mate didn't seem to be happy with the new captain. No one paid much attention to it back then, when they probably should have. 
The last sighting of Carol A. Deering at sea was on January 28, 1921, when a light ship noticed it off the coast of North Carolina. There was some commotion on the quarter deck of the ship where the crew were normally not allowed. Then another vessel sighted it, but there was already no one on the decks. On January 31st, the merchant ship was found hard aground in the Diamond Shoals, a site notorious for numerous shipwrecks that had been occupying there for centuries. When the search and rescue party boarded the ship, they found it abandoned, the log and personal belongings of the crew gone, along with the two lifeboats. There is still no answer to what happened on board of Carol A. Deering that January, although the most popular version was mutiny. Maybe we'll never find out the truth, though. SS Bechimo is perhaps one of the most notable ghost ships in history. This large cargo steamer was built in 1914 in Sweden and plotted its way dutifully over 16 years, trading provisions for pelts with native tribes of Alaska and Canada. But then, on October 1st, 1931, Bechimo got caught in pack ice. At first, it seemed the crew would be able to wait it out and continue on their route because the ship broke free in a couple of days. But in less than a week, it became caught again, this time for good. In another week, a rescue party was sent to fetch 22 of the Bechismo's crew, while another 15 remained behind to wait through the winter if necessary and get the ship back. But a month later, after a powerful blizzard struck their camp, the sailors went out of their shelters only to find the ship gone. Luckily, a few days later, a native hunter told the Bechimo hadn't been lost yet. He'd seen it about 45 miles from where they had been stationed. They managed to track it down, but decided the ship wouldn't survive the winter. So they took the most valuable cargo from its hold and abandoned it. They were wrong though, SS Bechimo did survive that winter and many more that followed. When the ice broke, it sailed away on its own, drifting listlessly along the shores of Canada and Alaska. There were numerous sightings of the ghost ship, sometimes adrift in the open sea, and at other times stuck in the pack ice again. People attempted to board and salvage it, but weather conditions or lack of equipment always prevented them. SS Bechimo was last sighted by native Alaskans in 1969, 38 years after its abandonment. What became of it later remains unknown. The story of SS Orang Maidan is one of the most puzzling and harrowing ghost ship stories of the 20th century. No one even knows for sure if the ship even existed in the first place. It wasn't recorded in Lloyd's Shipping, the International Register of Ships, which makes it either a tall tale or a vessel that avoided being officially recognized for some shady reasons. In any case, the accounts as to what happened to the Maidan vary. According to most reports, it was carrying some unknown cargo in the Indonesian waters when a distress call was received by another ship in the vicinity. The officer on duty heard an SOS message, but its contents are different depending on the accounts. The message did not repeat, and the crew of Maidan didn't answer to any attempts to contact it back. The ship that received the distress call hurried to the rescue, but they only reached the vessel the following day, when it was already drifting and slightly listing. When the rescuers boarded the ship, they found that none of the crew had survived. However, one lifeboat was missing, which implied that there was at least one crew member who managed to escape. What happened to the rest of the people on board remains a mystery to this day. Still, there are no hard facts about this story, so we might never find out whether SS Orang Maidan was actually a ship and not a thing of fiction. SV Zabrina was a three-mast sailing barge built in 1873 for river trade ships in South America. She served for well over four decades, proving to be a sturdy and reliable ship. It was later transferred to Europe, where it continued serving its purpose well. But then, in October 1917, Zabrina set sail on a regular voyage only to be found ashore several days later. Mysteriously, although the ship was perfectly intact, the entire crew of five and the captain were gone. There is no direct evidence or hard facts as to what really happened that day. The most convincing theory is that the crew were washed away from the deck because of an underwater explosion. And then the ship sailed ahead without them. But the truth, as always, remains unknown. 
It's 2018. You get up early in the morning to go ashore and catch some fish. You come to the spot you were yesterday, throw the hook into the sea, and wait. The float is twitching. You've caught some fish, but hey. Hello? Why aren't you doing anything? Right now, you don't care about the fish. You're looking at something in the distance. You open your mouth in surprise, since you see a huge ship stuck on a shoal. It wasn't here yesterday, so it got here at night. Okay, it'll probably sail away sooner or later. You fish for a few more hours. During this time, you observe the ship and notice no movement there. Is it empty? Boats and the coastal service are sailing from the shore to the vessel. You decide to check it out too. You get in your old boat and go there. The mist descends to the water, making the ship look creepy. The colossal vessel is rusty and empty. But where is the whole crew? And how did it get there? The Coast Guard comes on board. They search the hold, the cabins, and the upper deck. There's someone's stuff, some remnants of food supplies, notebooks, and clothes. Everything suggests the crew has disappeared for some reason. Fishers who noticed the vessel first didn't see anyone coming down from the board. No radio signals were sent to the port, and no one reported about the ship. It appeared here from nowhere. The only chance to get any information is to look at the number and name of the vessel. This is Sam Ratulangi, PB1600. The Coast Guard checks the information, studies the data of all the country ships, and no way. One company built the boat in 2001 in Indonesia. People used it to transport heavy loads across the seas around Asia. The ship had been properly operating for eight years. People were delivering industrial goods to different points in the region. But something went wrong. In 2009, Sam Ratulangi was sailing near the coast of Taiwan. And that's it. There were no further records about it. There were no reports in any port. Everyone thought it must have drowned, so no one had been looking for it for years. And then, nine years later, it appears here, big and rusty, off the coast of Myanmar, without sailors, without fuel. An investigation starts. City services are trying to find out the names of all the sailors working on the ship and find clues that would lead to solving this mystery. They also hope the ship owner will appear soon. They find two tow ropes on board. This means that some other ship towed Samratalangi to this place. Then they identify and find 13 crew members. These people say they wanted to reach the factory in Bangladesh to repair Samratalangi. Another vessel helped tow the ship, but then two cables tore off and a storm began. No one wanted to stay on board during such weather, so the crew members left it. No one knows what the ship has been doing for the last nine years and how it was possible without people on board. And here's another, much more mysterious ship story. On February 16th, 2020, locals found a large cargo ship stuck on a rocky shore off the coast of an Irish village. The boat looked rusty, with holes in the hull and rotten parts. People hadn't seen this vessel the day before, so it appeared there at night. The last time people saw the Alta cargo ship was a few months earlier, thousands of miles off the coast of Ireland. That day, the Alta was sailing in the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. Another ship, the MS Protector, noticed it. MS Protector crew members tried to contact the ship, but received no response. The people on board realized that they were facing an empty vessel. And then, five months later, it appeared near the coast of Ireland. There are more questions than answers in this story, but we managed to find something out. In 2015, the Alta appeared and disappeared from the radar several times. Any ship has an internal tracking system so people can track its route using satellites. But Alta crew members often disabled this system. Perhaps they were engaged in some illegal activity. Anyway, in 2017, the ship often sailed between the ports of Greek islands. Then. The tracking signal disappeared and appeared only 10 months later, off the coast of North Africa. During this time, the ship changed several flags. In September 2018, the Alta was southeast of Bermuda and headed for Haiti. Then, the crew started facing problems. 
First, the main engine failed right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The ship began to drift. Several days passed, but the crew members weren't able to repair it. They began to run out of food and water supplies. The situation got even worse when they found out that a hurricane was approaching the place. Fortunately, they managed to contact the U.S. Coast Guard. A helicopter flew to the Alta on October 2nd to bring them some supplies. There was enough food for several days. Then, a rescue boat sailed to the ship. It evacuated all the sailors and delivered them to Puerto Rico before the hurricane. The Alta had to drift alone in the ocean. After a while, another ship approached the Alta to tow it to the shores of Guiana. But at this moment, everything went wrong. Someone stole the boat, disabled the tracking system, and sailed away in an unknown direction. After almost a year, the MS Protector found the empty Alta in the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. And then, nine months later, the ship without a crew sailed to the shores of Ireland. How did it manage to travel across the Atlantic and get to the coast of Ireland? It's still a mystery. Maybe it was just luck. No one else saw the ship all this time. It was just covering huge distances, surviving storms. Who's the captain? What happened to the thieves? Who owns the ship now? One day, someone called the village administration and introduced themselves as the vessel owner. But that unknown person didn't provide any evidence. They found several barrels of oil on the ship, which they took away by helicopter. The Alta was rusting. Corrosion of metal could damage the environment. The vessel had no commercial value, yet it would have taken millions to get rid of it. There were three options for what to do. Leave the ship where it was, tow it into the sea and let it sink, or disassemble it for scrap. But nature had its own plans. Storms and strong waves split the hull into two parts. The Alta was drifting without a crew in the waters of the Atlantic Ocean for about two years. But this is nothing compared to a ship that was traveling for 38 years. The record belongs to the SS Bechimo. It was a merchant vessel owned by some trading company. In 1931, the ship found itself on the ice off the coast of Alaska. Its movement slowed down. A thick layer of ice blocked the ship, and a strong storm only made the situation worse. The blizzard was so intense that the crew members couldn't see anything but a white veil in front of their eyes. Sailing any further was impossible. The team had to wait for the storm to end. They waited for a day, two, three days. A week had passed, but the snowstorm was only getting stronger. Then, one day, it grew weaker. The crew members split into two teams. The first team went to the nearest city. The second group, along with the captain, stayed on board. They set up camp next to the ship and waited for the blizzard, which had started again, to end. There was zero visibility. And finally, one day, the storm was over. Great! And now, uh, wait a minute. But where is the ship? The SS Bechimo just disappeared during the blizzard. The captain was sure that the ship had sunk, so he left along with the crew. Then, a week later, they saw the vessel drifting near the area where they had lost it. The hull was damaged so severely that it was unsafe to sail on it. Repairing the ship would be pointless and expensive, so the captain decided to abandon it. He was sure that it would go underwater sooner or later, but it stayed afloat for the next few days, the next few months, and a few years. People had reported seeing it at various points along the coast of Alaska for 38 years. The last record of the SS Bechimo is dated 1969. Those who saw it claimed the ship was completely frozen, almost merged with the ice. Some people planned to start an expedition to find the ship, but all attempts were unsuccessful. The vessel is probably lying somewhere on the deep sea floor. There are lots of famous mysteries that you can explain now if you carefully study the details. The tragedy of the Titanic, for example. Anyone can recreate a picture of that night and build a map of those terrible events with all the information available online now. You can also explain what's going on in the Bermuda Triangle. Spoiler alert, nothing mysterious about it. Missing trains, time-traveling planes, 
strange black holes in the desert, spooky sounds, visual anomalies. You may not find the answers to all these riddles right away, but if you apply some critical thinking and a whole lot of dedication, you can eventually gain a better, more practical understanding of what exactly is going on. So I'm now gonna tell you about the disappearance of Martha Wright. But this story is not like all the others I just mentioned. This mysterious and creepy puzzle is almost impossible to solve. There are no leads, no clues, no theories that make any sense of it. This is one of those cases that can really make you feel clueless, pun intended. But regardless, I'll still try my best to explain it to you. So let's look at this story from the very beginning and try not to miss even the tiniest details. The year is 1975. Jackson Wright and his wife Martha Wright are going by car from New Jersey to New York. It's a little hot inside the cabin, so Jackson turns on his AC. The road they're on leads them into the Lincoln Tunnel. They're driving in there, slowing down a bit. After a few minutes, Jackson starts to wipe the windshield, holding his hand on the wheel. Some condensation has accumulated on the glass because of the unstable conditioner. The rear window is also slightly fogged up, so Jackson slows down and then stops the car. There are no other vehicles in the tunnel. Jackson takes two rags out of the glove compartment. He gives one of them to Martha and asks her to wipe the rear window. His wife is moving into the back seat to remove the condensation. She doesn't leave the car. Jackson wipes the front window for a few seconds, turns to Martha and can't find her. She's vanished. All the doors are closed. There is only one car in the tunnel, Jackson's. At first, he thinks it's some kind of a joke. He looks carefully at the back seats and out the windows. Martha, where are you? He asks in fear in his voice. He opens the door, his hands trembling. Martha, Jackson screams. His voice echoes through the entire dark tunnel. Martha Wright has just literally vanished into thin air. It's a bit creepy, isn't it? Poor Martha. And poor Jackson. At first glance, some might say that the real reason for Martha's disappearance is her husband, and that he made the whole story up as an excuse. We don't know what kind of relationship they were in. Maybe they had a fight or planned a divorce. Yes, it would be easy to blame the husband, but you don't have enough evidence to support that conclusion. Immediately after the disappearance, Jackson contacted the police. An investigation began. Detectives interviewed people passing by the tunnel that day. They carefully studied all the streets, alleys, and even the nearest basements. Of course, they didn't ignore the possibility that Jackson was guilty, but they couldn't find any evidence to that effect either. It almost seemed like Martha didn't exist at all. Jackson loved his wife. He couldn't get over the fact that no one could explain her disappearance. The police certainly couldn't find her. Jackson drove through that tunnel many times, hoping that one day, in the light of his headlights, the silhouette of his missing wife would appear. Are you getting nervous? Well, you need to beat that fear if you want to figure things out. You need to assess the situation with a clear mind. Okay, so it was 1975. There were no phones or cameras. There was one car in a dark tunnel. I'm sure there are some rooms and long corridors that connect the Lincoln Tunnel to the sewer system or the subway. So I'm thinking, what if someone took Martha Wright out of her car? What if it was mole people? You've probably heard of them, people that live in the underground labyrinths of the New York subway. There are a lot of rumors about them. The story goes that for some reason, they refused to live like ordinary citizens of the city and descended into its dungeons. They have no contact with sunlight at all. They can see in the dark. Their diet consists of rats and trash. They can quickly crawl on all fours and even climb walls. Their sense of smell is developed. 
and they can sense an uninvited guest from afar. Sometimes they get out of their tunnels at night to gather provisions or food. What if, on that terrible day in 1975, the mole people crept up to the car unnoticed, quietly opened the door, grabbed Martha, and dragged her into the kingdom of darkness? Jackson might not have noticed it. Sounds compelling, right? Well, fortunately, all these stories about mole people are fictional. There are people who live in the underground tunnel systems of major cities, but they don't look like moles, and they eat normal food. In other words, they're just people trying to survive. There are many articles on the internet describing their real life. They come down to live in the tunnels for various reasons. The most common story is that for one reason or another, they couldn't make it in the city. For example, one guy lost his job and had a fight with his wife and got injured, so everyone abandoned him and his only option was to migrate down below. There was one story of one woman who tried to hide from some bad people on those underground labyrinths. Hundreds and even thousands of people live in environments like these, each for their own reasons. And believe me, their way of life is not as terrible as it may seem. Many people in these tunnels have electrical appliances, internet access, water, and heating. Inside many of these communities, it is forbidden to steal, harm anybody, or behave rudely or obscenely. People here try to help each other. During the day, they can earn money by washing cars, or handing out bottles, or at the laundry. At night, they return back to the tunnels. Lots of these people just couldn't integrate into society. Some people are happier there because they don't have to pay taxes and rent. They don't have to follow the rules and pretend to be someone they aren't. Many of them are polite, smart, and well-educated. Often they are friends with many street artists and filmmakers. It's a unique lifestyle, all on its own, with its own communities. Occasionally, some of them would manage to get out of those tunnels, but then return, feeling that they really belong to the tunnel system and couldn't quite integrate with the world up above. It was in 1904 when the first line of the New York subway opened that stories about these mole people began to spread. Since then, these stories have been overrun with legends and myths. The city's residents thought that the tunnel's inhabitants had created secret societies with their own system of rules and laws, infrastructure, and the division between poor and rich. Few people ventured down there to check. But in the late 90s, more and more journalists began to conduct investigations about these mole people. Eventually, the myth was debunked. But who knows? Maybe in the 1970s, there were many dangerous people among the tunnel inhabitants. Honestly, I can't believe that they managed to pull Martha out of the car and into the tunnels without Jackson noticing. For one thing, she would have screamed or tried to kick loose. Plus, all the car doors were closed. So, as far as theories go, this ain't it. Okay, then let's keep looking. We have the car, the AC, the tunnel the sunny weather. All right, let's look at the tunnel again. It seems to me that something is wrong with it. Something in the story doesn't quite add up. If we look at the maps and traffic data, we will see that many drivers use the Lincoln Tunnel daily. I'm sure it was just as popular in the 1970s. So how is it possible that Jackson and his wife were the only visitors to this tunnel in the middle of the day? They were driving in it for a few minutes, then stopped to wipe the windows. And not a single car passed by during that time. The tunnel wasn't closed or under repair. Jackson wouldn't have been able to get there if that went the truth. People walk through this tunnel in any weather. They hide here from the rain and heat and use the tunnels like a little shortcut. You can meet anyone there at night, early in the morning, and in the afternoon. Why didn't Jackson see anyone? All right, we're getting nowhere with this. Let's look at this story from a different angle. Where were Jackson and Martha coming from? Where exactly were they going? To visit friends? 
Maybe their relatives? And who exactly were they? That's something we ought to know, right? And luckily for us, that's exactly where the most interesting part of the story actually is. As it turns out, there is no information about this married couple on the internet. You can check phone directories, databases, marriage registrations, and other sources, but you won't find Martha or Jackson Wright. You won't find their friends or relatives. That's strange, but what about the police? The case of the disappearance of Martha Wright is quite famous, after all. Some big newspapers wrote about it. Perhaps someone's even covered it on TV. But if you search for it, you will soon find that the information about Martha Wright is basically the same on all websites. It's a small column without any additional information. If you search on Google Books, you'll find one result. A book describing mystical tales with no evidence. Reading it, it really just feels like someone just took all of the world's most famous urban legends and put them together on one page. Well, there you go. Looks like we found our answer. Martha Wright didn't disappear because she never really existed. But don't give the credit to me. I'm not the genius who solved this. To find the answer, I visited the greatest detective community in the world, Reddit users. They solved the mystery of Martha's disappearance long ago and shared it with everyone. Okay, here's a rhetorical question. Why did reputable newspapers publish an article about Martha Wright? And this wouldn't be the only time either. This story is similar to another famous case about a young guy who was walking through a field near his farm and just vanished into thin air. His family and friends saw it with their own eyes. This story appeared in several films and TV shows about mystical phenomena without any evidence or details. What's the point of making it up? Well, to sell copies. People like these kinds of riddles. People can be strangely captivated by the prospect of the unknown. One of the most popular fake mysteries was about the Pan Am Flight 914. This plane took off in 1955 from New York and then disappeared from all radars. It was supposed to arrive in Florida a few hours later, but it landed at the airport in Venezuela 37 years later. Another case, 1954. Santiago Airlines Flight 513 took off from an airport in West Germany. The plane was due to land in Brazil in 18 hours. There were 88 passengers and four crew members on board. The plane disappeared from the sky and from the radar. Air traffic controllers tried contacting the pilots, but didn't receive any response. 18 hours later, they called the airport in Brazil. Those dispatchers couldn't confirm the plane's landing. They couldn't contact it either. The plane did eventually land on October 12th, 1989. It was in perfect condition, but none of the passengers had survived. These stories seem unrelated to each other, but they do have two things in common. First, you won't find a list of passengers or employees. You'll also find that those dispatches from the 50s and 80s didn't exist either. Second, you'll find that both of these stories were actually published in the same newspaper, one known for its tall tales and fake news. Once again, there is nothing mystical about these cases. But we have gotten to the truth. And now we know a lot more about how to evaluate information critically. The next time you hear about some girl seeing a flying monster near a rock festival or some guy disappearing from his pool, don't just believe it right away. Try to study the details, check the sources. As a rule, these kinds of fantastical stories fall apart if you look at them just a little more closely. The real world is complicated and mysterious, but it is by no means impossible to understand. You just need to think critically and pay attention to the details. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Hello, Brightsiders. I recently decided to propose to my girlfriend and I went to the jewelry shop. While choosing a ring, the seller told me stories about different stones. And one of them 
about why members of the royal family would never buy rubies was the most fascinating. Rumor has it that British monarchs see rubies as bad luck. But where would they get an idea like that and why did the superstition start in the first place? Nobody knows, but many people put it down to Queen Victoria. The story goes that the 19th century monarch didn't like this gorgeous red gemstone. As you know, Victoria, the great-great-grandmother of Elizabeth II, was very influential, especially regarding fashion trends. And anything the Queen of Trendsetting did like almost instantly became mandatory. As proof, let's remember that white satin wedding dresses only became all the rage after Queen Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert in 1840. Before that, brides wore all sorts of colors. The only color considered bad luck was, get ready for this, white. <laughs> Before Victoria changed the game, white was associated with misfortune. In some cultures, like in India, it still is. Since the queen could so quickly turn what was once bad luck into a wedding custom that would live for ages, it's natural to think she did the same thing only in reverse with rubies. After all, Victoria didn't wear them at her wedding. She wore sapphires and diamonds. But where did her distaste for rubies come from? Just personal preference or fear of an ancient curse? Let's look at the facts. Victoria's mother celebrated her daughter's wedding by giving her what's known as ruby parure. A parure is a set of jewels the royals wear together, like earrings and a necklace. As its name implies, it was brimming with rubies. Before handing it down, Victoria wore the coronet that was part of the set on many occasions. There is also a theory that her husband was the one with the ruby phobia and forbade the gemstones on their wedding day. But it turns out to be a myth because Victoria's engagement ring shaped like a serpent was made of tiny rubies, diamonds and an emerald. So while Queen Victoria started plenty of traditions, the idea that rubies are bad luck isn't one of them. And have all the British royals avoided rubies? Cause there has definitely been some bad luck associated with the red gemstone. The marriages that come after a ruby engagement don't seem to stand the test of time. Look at Princess Margaret, sister of Elizabeth II, and Sarah, Duchess of York, who'd been married to the Queen's son Andrew. Both had ruby engagement rings, and marriages didn't last. Maybe you've heard that as soon as Mary of Tech received a ruby engagement ring, the groom-to-be succumbed to influenza? Well, don't jump on the superstition train just yet. There's no evidence that Mary ever received a ring of any kind from the engagement. Her mother, Princess Mary Adelaide, Queen Victoria's cousin, didn't get a ruby ring. The marriage didn't end, but it was pretty much a case of Mary settling for a suitor because she had no other options. Not exactly an epic love story. Or do you think the gem was at fault? And what about all those other unhappy brides with rubies on their fingers? If we're looking for examples of unlucky marriages in the British monarchy, the first person that comes to mind is Henry VIII. Of Henry's six wives, two may have donned rubies. Anne of Cleves wore what looked like an emerald and a ruby ring in the portrait that convinced Henry to marry her. Unfortunately, the real Anne proved less appealing, so Henry ordered their marriage annulled the following year. On the bright side, if you know anything about what happened to Henry's other wives, then it seems like the ruby ring was a lucky one for Anne. Well, the second wife to wear the ring, Catherine of Hovard, wasn't so lucky. I guess this disproves the theory altogether. But think about this. Many of the rocks on those engagement rings come from crowns. Unsurprisingly, the royal family has all sorts of bejeweled headpieces. 
dainty coronets, small tiaras, and the one with the world's largest uncut ruby, the Black Princess Ruby. You might not have heard the name, but I'm sure you've seen it. Picture the king or queen of England and the big crown on their head, the one that looks like a puffy fur hat. It's known as the Imperial State Crown, and it's probably the reason why you drew crowns the way you did when you were a kid. You know, with the giant blob of red in the middle. Well, the blob is a ruby. Yeah, it's that big, about two inches long and weighing 170 carats. That's almost the weight of a golf ball, which wouldn't sound impressive if we weren't talking about the gemstone here. The famous and historic ruby isn't precisely a ruby. It's a spinel, but I won't get too technical here. It was named after Edward of Woodstock back in the 14th century, and he went by the nickname the Black Prince because of the black armor and the shield he wore. Edward got the ruby from another king, Don Pedro the Cruel, in exchange for helping him to deal with some unrest in his territory. But before Edward got a hold of it, the giant gem had its own mysterious and troublesome past. Some people believe that the ruby was cursed by the Prince of Granada, from who Don Pedro had taken it. There's no evidence that Don Pedro cursed the ruby again before giving it to Edward, but it's hard to imagine a guy nicknamed the Cruel parting very peacefully with a jewel that big. But did the Black Prince's ruby bring good luck or bad luck to the royals? I guess it depends on who you ask. Henry V wore a gem-encrusted helmet that included the Black Prince's ruby when fighting in France in 1415. One day, he got whacked in the head really hard. What's worse, he nearly lost his fancy helmet. Bad luck. Then again, he survived, and he kept the helmet and the ruby. So, good luck. Richard III was supposedly wearing the Black Prince's ruby when he was in Bosworth Field fighting it out with Henry Tudor towards the end of the same century in 1485. All I'll say is, Richard wasn't so lucky. Yes, that points to the ruby being bad, but that's only a rumor. Maybe he wasn't wearing it at all. While you're thinking about that, consider this. That ruby now resides smack in the middle of one of history's most recognizable crowns. And as I said, a lot of royal engagement rings feature jewels that previously adorned crowns. Imagine what would happen if a would-be princess told her love-struck prince that she'd love to have, you know, a big shiny ruby. I don't know, maybe the biggest one out there, the Black Prince's ruby. If you are heard of Romeo and Juliet, you know it's not easy to dissuade young love. And when it comes to royal families who tend to marry royalty from other countries, such a denial could even start some major conflict. Wouldn't it be better to avoid the whole thing by concocting a myth? Then the king could tell his love-struck son, I know she likes rubies and I'd love to give it to her, but did I tell you about the curse? Oh, it's terrible. If you love her and want her to be safe and happy, you must make sure she never wears this ruby. Or maybe the trends just changed over time. Rubies were out, diamonds were in, and that switch could have been done on purpose. We now see diamonds as the go-to engagement rock, but it wasn't always that way. Before 1940, only about 10% of brides-to-be received diamond engagement rings. What changed? Well, experts point to an ad campaign by a jeweler named The Beer's Diamonds that linked these rocks with love, and it worked. But the more superstitious members of the royal family will swear by the evidence. If rubies mean short-lived marriage, then diamonds are forever. Like the 15-year marriage of Camilla and Charles, Sophie and Edward going strong for 20 years, Queen Elizabeth herself had a diamond engagement ring, and she and Prince Philip have been married for over 70 years. Maybe it's because of history or just trends. I'll let you decide why the British royal family has sworn off rubies. 
Meet Arthur John Priest. No, he isn't famous for being a painter or for discovering some long-lost treasure. He didn't invent some cool gadget or break any world records. No, Arthur John Priest is famous simply for being unsinkable. Proving one can be both lucky and unlucky at the same time, Priest was involved in and survived several mishaps at sea, including the fateful maiden voyage of the Titanic. Priest was not a rich man interested in sailing for pleasure. He was part of the working class, employed as a stoker or fireman, stuck for hours within the hot bowels of large steam-powered vessels. His job was dirty and difficult. He was responsible for keeping the furnaces lit, feeding them coal to ensure enough steam was produced for the engines to work. He had to be careful about not overheating the system or setting fire to the whole ship. The furnaces had to be carefully watched and constantly fed. He breathed it all in a while, working and fighting with the sweat and the dirt. He would often work shirtless because of the heat and was always covered in black coal dust. And when he finally had a break, his shared living quarters were nearby in the same part of the ship. He must have been good at his job though, because he had no trouble finding work. But wherever he went, bad luck seemed to follow. The first incident was a mild one. As a young man, Priest worked on the RMS Asturias. The passenger liner first set sail in 1907, traveling between Southampton in the UK to Buenos Aires in Argentina. At some point during its maiden voyage, the ship suffered a small collision. The damage was bad enough that the ship returned for repairs. Thankfully, there were no reports of any serious injuries. Priest, unfazed, simply went to work on another ship. But his bad luck lingered on the Asturias. In 1914, the Asturias became a hospital ship, helping care for sick men and women around Europe while bringing them home to England. But in March 1917, at just around midnight, the ship was struck by a foreign object. Its hull was breached and the engine room flooded. The captain ordered everyone to abandon the ship, sending crew, patients, and health staff scrambling for the lifeboats. The vessel was still moving, powering through the water because the main controls, located within the flooded engine room, could not be turned off. The captain refused to leave the ship while people were still trying to escape. He was able to aim the Asturias towards Bolt Head, where it finally hit land and couldn't sink. The remaining lifeboats were lowered and the final survivors made it to safety. When they studied the damage on the ship later, the Asturias was declared a total write-off. It might be hard to pin this particular disaster on Priest. After all, he wasn't even on the ship at the time. But it seemed that many of the ships on which he served were destined for trouble. His bad luck followed him to his next job on the RMS Olympic, a massive ocean liner. The Olympic was big. In fact, it had been designed and built as part of the fleet that included the Titanic. But with size came sacrifice. The Olympic was great at moving in one direction, but very difficult to handle when it needed to turn. It was September 1911. The Olympic was trying to alter its course. The Hawk, a smaller ship sailing nearby, didn't give the larger vessel enough room to maneuver, and the two slammed into each other. Because the Hawk was engineered to deal with potential confrontations when out at sea, its reinforced bow tore through the Olympic. Two large gashes appeared on the ocean liner's side. The propeller shaft was badly twisted. And worse, the ship began to take on water. Somehow, the Olympic made it to shore without sinking, and nobody was seriously hurt. Priest had no idea that this was just a small taste of what his future held for him. He next found employment on a brand new ship, a better ship, an unsinkable marvel that was said to be the biggest vessel to have ever been built. Yes, he was going to work on the Titanic. And what a job. It took 29 boilers, requiring 850 tons of coal a day, to produce enough steam to power the Titanic. Priest was just one of 150 stokers toiling away in the ship's underbelly, keeping those fires burning day and night. He made around $30 a month. But on April 14, 1912, he would find himself flung from a world of extreme heat to one of blistering cold. At approximately 11.35 p.m., the crew spotted an iceberg. The Titanic tried to avoid it, but the alarm had been sounded too late. Five minutes later, the two collided. The iceberg tore through the hull, 
and the once watertight compartments inside were badly ruptured. As the cold Atlantic water flooded in, the ship began to sink. Distress signals were sent, but the closest ship, the Carpathia, was over three hours away. In the dark of night and stuck in the middle of nowhere, the crew and passengers panicked. Those who could scrambled for the lifeboats. Others jumped into the icy waters. In total, only 706 survived that terrible night. Priest, at the time of the collision, was down in the ship's lower quarters. He was on break, relaxing from a hard day of work. And as the ship went down, so did his chances of survival. He and his fellow workers were in the most dangerous position on the ship. They had to make their way through a maze of corridors and gangways, some of which were flooded in a mad dash to the deck. And then they faced the frigid water, jumping in and desperately swimming to safety. The ocean was so cold that Priest even suffered frostbite before finding his way onto a lifeboat. He was one of only 44 stokers to survive that night. After an experience like that, most of us would never set foot on a boat again. But Priest had to work. His next job also ended in disaster. He was offered employment on the HMS Alcantara. It went down in 1916, and Priest was again one of the few to make it to safety. He was badly wounded in the process. But he kept pressing his luck, and his next job as a stoker may have felt eerily familiar. He would be working on a ship built by the same people behind both the Olympic and the Titanic. And this ship, named the Britannic, was the biggest of the three. It was also believed to be a superior vessel, fitted with new safety features after the Titanic sank. For example, it had 48 open lifeboats, 46 of which were the largest ever used on a ship before. Two of these were even motorized and equipped with special communication devices. The good news? The Britannic survived its first trip without incident. It was already doing better than the Titanic ever did. However, on November 21, 1916, the Britannic was shaken by a loud explosion while traveling through the Key Channel in the Aegean Sea. The hull was damaged and some of the compartments began to fill with water. But, unlike the Titanic, the Britannic had been designed for just such an emergency. It had been fitted with five watertight bulkheads. Intact, these would help keep the ship safe and floating for a much longer period of time. But there was one issue. Portholes along the lower decks had foolishly been left open. As the ship tilted, the portholes let in water, which flooded the Britannic and hastened its descent into the sea. This effectively made those watertight bulkheads useless. The ship was going down fast, much faster, in fact, than the Titanic had sunk. 35 of the lifeboats were successfully launched, saving most on board. Of the 1,066 passengers and crew, 1,036 survived. Priest, his luck intact, was one of them. And yet, he still wasn't done with a life at sea. He accepted a position as a stoker on the Donegal. It was a smaller passenger ferry that had been converted for use as a hospital boat. In April 1917, it was struck by a foreign object while fleeing an unsafe situation. And though he suffered from a head injury, Priest was again one of the survivors. It took experiencing two collisions and four sinkings before Priest was finally ready to retire. In fact, he reportedly said he only gave it up because no one wanted to sail with him. Can you blame them? He would live out the rest of his life on dry land in Southampton, England, with his wife, Annie, and their three sons. But Arthur John Priest would always be remembered as the unsinkable stoker. So in 2017, over 25 million people boarded cruise ships all over the world. Now, if you're keeping count, that's more than the total population of Greece. It's become America's favorite choice when it comes to going on vacation. It's easy to see why hopping aboard a cruise ship becomes more popular each year. Heading out on a cruise is also coming back in style with newer generations. Two-thirds of Gen Y and Millennials say that cruising is their new preferred type of vacation. How's that? Well, let's see. It's easy to plan in advance. On board, you can find activities for all family members, and you get a chance to visit several different destinations in one trip. An added bonus of booking a cruise? You can sample various places for a future time off. The entertainment on board is often top-notch. 
providing passengers with an added taste of luxury. And the amenities and accommodations are generally very reliable. Not to mention that it gives tourists that feeling of actually getting away from everything that people strive for while out of the office. Royal Caribbean International is one of the largest cruise lines in the world, with just over 19% of the cruise market as of 2018. Its current fleet is divided into many different classes of ships, including the Voyager class, Radiance, and Quantum. The latest addition to the Royal Caribbean International's impressive fleet was built in 2018. Wonder of the Seas is now the largest cruise ship in the world. Since this spectacular liner has just had her maiden voyage in March 2022, let's look at some of the incredible perks it has to offer its passengers. For starters, the boat is so big that it had to be split into neighborhoods. Well, it figures since Wonder of the Seas can accommodate almost 7,000 passengers. Fond of New York? Well, no worries. Wonder of the Seas has a central park of its own, with an estimated 10,000 plants to check out. The ship's central park is a feature of all Oasis-class ships, being one of the so-called neighborhoods. Let's look at some other areas, shall we? Like this boardwalk, a place that includes an arcade, a candy store, and a sports bar. It's best suited for long walks. There's a pool and sports zone on Wonder of the Sea. These areas feature the ship's numerous pools and hot tubs. There are many activities to check out on the sports court. Then there's the Royal Promenade, or Promenade if you prefer. That's the main road on Wonder of the Seas, with bars, lounges, and places to grab a cup of coffee, or a luxurious latte. The entertainment neighborhood is the focal point for leisure activities on the ship. Here, guests can find a comedy club, an ice skating rink, and even a theater. The spa and fitness area is a tranquil zone with a huge array of treatments available. The fitness center is free of charge, by the way, so there's no excuse for guests to skip a leg day. An extra eighth zone was added to Wonder of the Seas. It's called the Suite Neighborhood. This is an exclusive area designed for guests staying in the suites. Oh, now I get it. It's located at the top of the ship. Guests here have designated staff members called Royal Genies. Yeah, if you rub a lamp in your suite, they appear. Nah, not really. The genies are similar to butlers. They can cater to just a few cabins. Of course, the cruise line wants to divert other guests from asking these crew members various questions and taking their time. That's why the genies don't wear name tags in public areas. As for its itinerary, Wonder of the Seas was initially supposed to be homeported in China. But Royal Caribbean decided to move the liner to the United States. In March 2022, the ship started its journey with seven-night Eastern and Western Caribbean itineraries. In May 2022, Wonder of the Seas is scheduled for a trip to Europe, with Western Mediterranean cruises from Barcelona and Rome planned for its guests. Passengers will also be able to visit Palma de Mallorca, Spain, and Capri, Italy. When the summer season is over, Wonder of the Seas is scheduled to return to Florida to offer year-round sailing starting November 2022. And by the way, there is no truth to the rumor that a special cruise only for highly allergic and hay fever sufferers will be called the Wonder of the Sneeze. Nope, not at all. Now, it's hard to imagine a ship so massive that can accommodate so many amenities on board. For example, the Titanic was the largest ship of its time, measuring 882 feet in length. And Wonder of the Seas is not only 1188 feet long, it's also 36% taller and 34% wider. Speaking of lifeboats, which I am about to, Titanic had a mere 20 lifeboats on board, which was tragically not enough to fit all the passengers after the ship hit the iceberg. But Wonder of the Seas has an even smaller number of lifeboats, 18 to be precise. Sounds weird and dangerous? Well, not really, given that each of these lifeboats can accommodate up to 370 people. 
It means that all the passengers and crew members, an estimated 8,000 people if fully booked, are going to be safe in case of an emergency. If we could somehow have a race between the two ships, well, Titanic was in fact the faster ship out of the two, beating Wonder of the Seas by one knot per hour. Cruise ship passengers today are more interested in the experience rather than the speed of the boat itself. That's why how fast a ship can travel is not an extremely important aspect nowadays. In terms of costs, Titanic cost around $7.5 million at the time of its construction. It's the equivalent of about $200 million today. How about Wonder of the Seas? Well, it cost a staggering $1.35 billion to build making it six times more expensive than the Titanic. How about we compare ticket prices? Well, in this case, the least expensive ticket on Titanic was 7 pounds. It's about $1,000 today. The cheapest ticket on Wonder of the Seas is currently 423 bucks. But prices may vary depending on the location, season, itinerary, and how much you tip your royal genie. And I know you were going to ask, how about icebergs? Well, Titanic steamed in the frigid North Atlantic, where you had to be on the lookout for those. Wonder of the Seas will be cruising the balmy Caribbean, where the worst thing you can hit on is 17 in blackjack. Oops, busted. Anyway, set side by side with its other sisters from the Royal Caribbean fleet, Wonder of the Seas is equally as impressive. The company's earliest ships could host about 2,500 people. This included passengers and the staff. Such ships were Splendor of the Seas, Legends of the Seas, and the smallest of them all, Thumbelina of the Seas. No, wait, that should be Empress of the Seas. Oops, my bad. The largest ships in the company's fleet can now house about 9,000 people altogether. It's almost three times the size and capacity of the earlier liners. Wonder of the Seas is one of them, as well as Harmony of the Seas and Symphony of the Seas. Are you seeing a pattern here? Yep, if you ever encounter a ship with Of the Seas in its name, it's safe to assume it belongs to Royal Caribbean. But if it's a can of tuna, it might actually be Chicken of the Sea. Hey, I like tuna! Now, choosing between cruise ships based on their size is like wondering if you should visit your local museum or the Louvre in Paris. It all depends on your preferences. Some families prefer small settings. Others are a fan of large spaces that can provide everything they need. Historically, it's equally as exciting how far we've come in terms of maritime transportation. The SS Royal William, for example, was the first boat to ever make a transatlantic voyage almost entirely steam-powered in 1833. And it was a mere 160 feet long and could house roughly 155 passengers. And if the seas were calm, then they were housed less roughly. <laughs> Similarly, the first modern megaship in the world was the MS Sovereign of the Seas. Launched in 1987, it was only 888 feet long and could carry a little under 3,000 passengers. Size and capacity are not the single improvements added to newer cruise ships out there. Recent technological developments in artificial intelligence and facial recognition have allowed cruise operators to ensure faster, smoother boarding for passengers. If, in the past, it took from 60 to 90 minutes for all passengers to board a ship, nowadays, cruise ship operators manage to get people comfortably settled in less than 15 minutes. Now, I'm sure you're already eager to book a ticket. But let's look into some of the more interesting activities you can try on board Wonder of the Seas. This way, you'll know what you're getting yourself into. All Royal Caribbean ships have loads of artworks available for their guests to enjoy. But Wonder of the Seas goes above and beyond, even featuring statues of astronauts in key locations around the ship. You'll find the first astronaut looking through the glass at the promenade, while a second one is busy rock climbing at the boardwalk. The third and last astronaut is more of a movie fan. This statue can be found near the movie screen sitting area. Going astronaut sightseeing is proving to be quite the experience among guests. In the areas with no access to sunlight, 
Wonder of the Seas features virtual balconies. In case of bad weather, guests can still have a feeling of the outdoors, but without having to hide from wind or rain. Teenagers have a place of their own reserved on the ship. There's a special club with a private hot tub, selfie area, games, and comfortable seating. The inside part of this club features a vending machine, an interesting collection of literature, and tables for foosball. Well, sign me up! It has recently become a popular location for many tourists looking for the perfect place to get away from it all. If you're lucky enough to catch a sunny day here, it's like no other, I can assure you. Chances are, you'll end up having loads of foggy days. But let's be honest, they have a special allure of their own. This enchanting smile-shaped island is called Sable Island. It's located 190 miles from mainland Nova Scotia. It wasn't accessible to the general public until 2013. That's when it was added to the list of National Parks of Canada. You can get here either by plane or by water. But what's so enchanting about this place anyway? There must be something since the yearly tourist count is growing every year. Firstly, there's a spectacular number of wild horses here. There are between 200 and 500 horses roaming free all over the island. There's also a large population of grey seals. The place is also the only breeding location of a rare bird species called the Ipswich Sparrow. If you're already considering a trip here, there are some things you need to know first. Remember that fog I mentioned earlier? Well, it turns out that Sable Island is the foggiest place in the Canadian Maritimes. I'm talking about approximately 127 foggy days each year. During such days, Sable Island literally disappears underneath a thick layer of fog. You won't be able to explore the place on your own either. The local regulations state that visitors need to travel within a group, and they also need to keep a 197-foot distance from the wildlife they can encounter here. As charming as this place may be, it holds a dark secret hidden beneath the sandy dunes, and it has nothing to do with beautiful creatures living here or the island's unique vegetation. Apart from being known from its horses and seals, Sable Island is infamous for an overwhelming number of shipwrecks. Over the years, about 350 ships have ended their lives here, on these sandbars. When survivors described their experiences, they usually mentioned harsh weather conditions near this mysterious island. The island also made its way into literature when it was described in a book called The Perfect Storm, which was written by Sebastian Younger and published in 1997. The book was so successful that it was later adapted for the big screen in 2000, with George Clooney playing the leading role. The first recorded shipwreck near Sable Island dates back to 1583. The boat was named the HMS Delight and was under the command of British adventurer and explorer Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Only 17 people managed to survive the catastrophe by escaping in a small boat. Records mention that they spent seven days at sea before reaching the shores of Newfoundland. In 1884, another vessel named the Nicosia struggled in the thick fog as well. The ship was completely destroyed, but fortunately, all 18 crew members managed to survive. The captain's son was almost lost at sea when a lifeboat capsized when he was climbing into it. He somehow managed to stay underneath the lifeboat, which was completely submerged. When this lifeboat righted, he eventually emerged from the water and was rescued for the second time. The years between 1947 and 1999 were relatively quiet on the island. In 1999, though, a yacht called the Merrimack ran aground near the shore of the island at about 2 a.m. on July 27th. The 40-foot fiberglass boat had a crew of only three people. Natural gas exploration workers, who were luckily not far away, rescued them. The crew managed to fly safely to Halifax the next day. The owner of the Merrimack tried to recover his boat by hiring local fishermen. Unfortunately, this operation was unsuccessful, since only the fittings of the yacht were eventually saved. It took no more than six weeks for the sand and waves to crush and completely break up the hull of the Merrimack. So what is it about this place that's so dangerous for boats? Does it have anything to do with the weather? Or maybe there's other forces at play? The explanation turns out to be a bit more complex, 
and it wasn't easy to figure out, at least not way back in the 1500s. First of all, the island is located close to one of the world's richest fishing grounds. Since it's also near one of the major shipping routes between Europe and North America, hundreds of vessels sail past it each year. The likelihood of shipwreck increases when there are so many boats roaming around the area. Sable Island is also in the way of most of the storms that move up the Atlantic coast of North America. It's no surprise that boats often get hurtled straight onto the shores of this island. The weather has a lot to do with it too. During the summer season, the warm air from the Gulf Stream creates a dense fog as it merges with the cool air by the Labrador Current that passes by the island. Other currents don't help the matter. Sable Island is next to the meeting point of three major ocean currents, the Gulf Stream, the Labrador Current, and the Belle Isle Current. Since the 1950s, radars and other modern navigation tools have been used on commercial vessels as well. Up until then, the sextant was the main instrument used to figure out a ship's location. It doesn't mean that sextants weren't accurate, but this instrument couldn't work properly without a clear view of the sun or stars, which means it didn't help much in dense fog, such as the one surrounding Sable Island, or when it was cloudy. Often during bad weather, the captain of a ship navigated, relying on their experiences and intuition based on the ship's speed and direction. That's why most of the survivors in shipwrecks near Sable Island said that the captain had simply miscalculated the ship's position, crashing into Sable Island by accident. This dusty, sandy land is as unfriendly to ships as it is to trees. There's reportedly a single tree on the whole island, and it looks a lot more like a bush. It's actually a pine tree. And since the famous island horses don't see it as much of a food source, it somehow managed to survive. Reports say that the tree was planted back in the 1950s. Local authorities were trying to grow a forest on the island to make it a bit more welcoming. They've planted tens of thousands of trees over the years, more than 69,000 evergreens, 600 fruit trees, and about 55 pounds of pine seeds, along with other plants which could survive the conditions on the island. But they were no match for the extreme weather and sandy soil. Out of all those plants, just one pine tree is still alive. Thanks to its resistance, it has even become a symbol of Sable Island. Interestingly, for around 40 years, the island also had just one inhabitant. Can you imagine that? One person living on a remote island for so many decades? It's the story of a woman called Zoe Lucas. She chose to surround herself with the only residents on the island, the horses, the gray seals, and the many species of birds. An esteemed naturalist, she mentioned in an interview she gave back in 2017 that she was used to living on the island and that she never got lonely. To survive here, she had to put together an essentials kit. It included a notebook to take notes and a pair of binoculars to study the wildlife. You can safely assume she wasn't scared of the intimidating surroundings since she decided to eventually call this place home. At first, Zoe wanted to set up camp on one end of the island, near some abandoned buildings. But eventually, she settled in a wooden house near a bunch of sand dunes. A Canadian institution called the Meteorological Service of Canada put together the simple construction back in the 1940s. Parks Canada operates the building these days. Zoe's work included gathering as much data on the local horse population as possible. It could help scientists better understand how they managed to adapt to the unfriendly environment. She also helped gather the debris that made it to the shore to help track pollution levels. Among all the rubbish that she collected, there was a refrigerator and a crate full of fresh peppers. Some other specialists eventually started working rotating shifts on Sable Island to offer the brave woman a little bit of company now and then. The voyage started just like any other. The cargo ship SS Cotopaxi is making another journey to Havana, Cuba to deliver coal. It's November 29, 1925. For Captain Meyer and his crew, leaving Charleston Port, South Carolina, it will be the last trip the ship ever makes. Its route ran through the Bermuda Triangle. Two days into the trip, the Cotopaxi sent out a distress signal. It had got caught up in a strong tropical storm and turned over on its side. The wind was very strong and there was powerful lightning as well. Rain gradually filled the ship's hold. Then there was a bright white flash and the ship disappeared without a trace. 
Later, its wreckage was found in the Gobi Desert, which is in a completely different part of the world. All 32 crew members, including the captain, were missing. Of course, the part about the Gobi Desert is fictional. For one of his movies, Steven Spielberg came up with the idea that the ship was moved there by aliens. Still, in real life, the ship was never found, and its crew really did disappear. It was officially declared missing a month afterward, and nobody could find the wreck. It seems like a classic case of mysterious things going on in the Bermuda Triangle. But most mysteries are solved sooner or later. In 2020, the Cotopaxi was found. A man named Michael Barnett had moved to Florida to study shipwrecks off the coast. One wreck in particular really caught his attention. It was much larger than the others, and the locals called it the Bear Wreck. It was about 40 miles from St. Augustine in northern Florida. But no one had ever managed to identify the rusty hull. So Michael started to do some detective work. He measured the size of the shipwreck and started working through all the information he could find. He researched hundreds of old newspapers, leafed through insurance records, and looked at artifacts found on the wreck. After hundreds of hours of hard work, Michael was sure it was the Cotopaxi. But a few years before, there had been a rumor that the same ship had been found off the coast of Cuba. The Coast Guard found the wreck of a cargo ship about the same size that looked a lot like the one lost in 1925. Michael was sure they were wrong, so he teamed up with some science journalists and kept investigating. Soon, they discovered something that seemed to confirm Michael's belief. Divers found brass valves with the letters SV on them in the wreckage of the ship. Michael suggested these initials referred to Scott Valve Manufacturing Company. The headquarters of this company was in Michigan, not far from where the Cotopaxi had been built. The company had probably supplied parts for the Cotopaxi. So the puzzle seemed to be solved. The bear wreck was really the missing cargo ship. But Michael still needed to work out why the ship had sunk. Did something mysterious really happen to the Cotopaxi in the Bermuda Triangle? Later, Michael found the testimony of the ship's carpenter among some old papers. The carpenter claimed that the hatches covering the coal on the ship had been in a terrible condition before it sank. Repair work on the covers wasn't finished before the crew got the order to sail to Cuba. So if the hatch covers were still broken during the trip, water could have easily gotten on board. This water probably flooded the hole during the tropical storm. This was the real reason why the Cotopaxi went down. There was really nothing mysterious about it. It was just a mistake made by ordinary people. But this is just one example out of dozens, or even hundreds, where ships and planes have gone missing in the Bermuda Triangle. We still can't explain some of these incidents. It seems like there really is something weird going on there. One of these strange events happened in 1948. A passenger jet was headed for Miami from San Juan, Puerto Rico. It disappeared in the same area as the Cotopaxi. The 32 people on board vanished without a trace. The weather was clear throughout the flight, but experts think that when the plane was about 50 miles from the coast, it could have been hit by a strong wind that knocked it off course. Years later, a similar plane was found in the area of the Bermuda Triangle. But because no one could work out the registration, it was impossible to say for sure if it was the same one. Something even stranger occurred not long before, in 1945. Five planes went missing all at the same time. Some trainee pilots were practicing their navigation skills. But when they'd finished, it seems they couldn't find their way back home and disappeared. Many people assumed they just ran out of fuel. This seems likely, but still, the circumstances were really strange. The trainees were being supervised by an experienced pilot who had 2,500 hours of flight time. He would never have let a group of newbie pilots get that far away from their base. Even now, people still debate what could have happened. Some insist the pilots ran into something supernatural out there in the Bermuda Triangle. But who knows? And here's another freaky thing that happened there which no expert has been able to explain. Time travel. 
1970, Bruce Gurnon was flying a plane from Andros Island to the Florida coast. When he was at 11,500 feet, a giant cloud appeared in front of him. It kept getting bigger and bigger, and he had no choice but to fly through it. As soon as he did, the plane was surrounded by darkness. It was as if the day had turned to night in a split second. Suddenly, Bruce began to see white flashes of light around him. They were so bright that they lit up the entire sky. But they weren't lightning bolts, although he couldn't really explain what they were. The plane continued through the strange cloud for almost a half an hour. Bruce noticed that the cloud changed shape during this time. The space around the plane turned into a tunnel. Then the tunnel started narrowing. Bruce became really tense as he tried to cope with the plane's controls. All his instruments and navigation equipment were going crazy, and the electronics stopped working. Then, a white light appeared at the end of the tunnel. Just like in the movies, the plane escaped the closing cloud tunnel at the very last second. Everything was fine, but now Bruce found himself in some white fog. He had no idea where he was. Then, he managed to contact ground control. He was shocked when he learned that his plane was already in the airspace above Miami. It seemed that something impossible had happened. Bruce was meant to cover a distance of about 250 miles during the flight. This usually took one and a half hours, but he had managed it in just 47 minutes, almost two times faster than normal. When Bruce landed, he went to check the amount of fuel left in the tank. It turned out he'd used up a lot less than the normal amount of fuel as well. Could there be a logical explanation for the time-traveling plane? Well, records show that a large number of sunspots were detected on the surface of the sun that day. And there was a strong solar wind. This could easily have made the electronics and devices on the plane go crazy. But what about the mysterious cloud? The Florida coast is a place where two large air currents meet. One has a high pressure, and the other is a low pressure one. This causes a lot of storm clouds in the area. But people still debate how Bruce was able to cover the distance so quickly. Some people say that some kind of mysterious dark energy was involved. Others say it was a gravitational anomaly that curved space and time. Others think that Bruce is just a fraud. We still don't know the truth. So, is there really something supernatural about the Bermuda Triangle? Or is it all just coincidences and made-up stories? The truth is that no more planes and ships disappear in the Bermuda Triangle than anywhere else in the world. Far out in the open sea, on a perfectly calm day, a dot appears on the horizon. It grows in size as it gets closer, and soon you can see it's a ship. But when you look at it through the spyglass, chills go down your spine. The vessel is in perfect condition and its cargo is on board, but it's completely devoid of people, drifting listlessly along the current. That was what the captain of the Ellen Austin saw in 1881 and what brought his crew so many sorrows. In December of the previous year, the Ellen Austin, a big 210-foot-long ship, left the port of Liverpool to make its trip to New York. The ship was carrying a load of people, hoping to find a better life in the New World. Captain A.J. Griffin took the vessel due southwest for a shorter voyage, and a few weeks into 1881, they found themselves north of the Sargasso Sea, known for its lack of winds and strong circling currents. Ships that got caught in those could lose control and keep on drifting in circles until they were dragged into the center. From there, they'd be incredibly lucky to get back past the currents. But more often than not, they stayed in the desolate desert of the sea forever. Worse still, the area belonged to the notorious Bermuda Triangle, which was already known to take down ships and make them disappear without a trace. The ship's crew were nervous, afraid of being in such a dangerous area so close to a sea that could bring them to a standstill. And ominously, some of the Sargasso Sea's calm must have escaped it, because the Ellen Austin lost its speed one day and fell adrift without the winds. It was fine, though. They had ample provisions and were still on schedule. 
Captain Griffin was walking around his ship, giving orders in a voice full of calm authority, and both his crew and passengers trusted him completely. But then, the lookout shouted from above that a ship was in sight. And indeed, when the captain looked in the direction the man was pointing, he saw a small schooner moving slowly into view and towards the Ellen Austin. As it came closer, it became apparent that the way the strange vessel moved wasn't right. The captain frowned and examined it through his spyglass. The schooner was untouched, but eerily silent. There wasn't a single soul on board. Derelict ships weren't that rare in the Atlantic at the time, but neither were pirates. Captain Griffin decided to wait and watch. After two days, the schooner was as quiet as always, and Captain finally thought it was fine to move in. He took a small team of sailors and boarded the stranded ship. There was nobody there indeed, but luck seemed to be on Griffin's side. The precious cargo of mahogany wood was still in the holds. The captain returned to the Ellen Austin and ordered his select men to take the smaller ship along to New York. The crew's spirits arose with the prospect of riches awaiting them upon arrival. When the winds blew strong again, the Ellen Austin continued its voyage, with the unnamed vessel tagging along. But after a couple of days, the ships were caught in a powerful storm and got separated. The wind, rain, and waves beat them for several days in a row. When the weather finally cleared, Captain Griffin ordered to find the schooner. They searched for another day until they finally found it adrift, way off the course. Griffin hailed his men on board the smaller ship, but no one answered. A party of sailors went to investigate and returned with their faces white with fear. The whole prize crew went missing in the storm. The captain wasn't one to lose such a valuable find, though, and ordered another team to take control of the schooner. Reluctantly, the sailors obeyed, and the two ships continued their voyage. They agreed to stay as close as possible to one another and ring their bells at set intervals at night to let each other know they were fine. Several nights went all right, with bells ringing reassuringly every hour. But one day, a thick blanket of fog fell on the sea and almost completely blocked their vision. The ships went on regardless and started sounding their bells earlier. When night came, the fog was still there, but the bells were the sound of life. Until they stopped. Captain Griffin rang the bell once, then twice. No answer. The crew lit the fires and looked out into the sea intently. But the fog hadn't lifted, and they couldn't see a thing in the swirling abyss beyond the ship's board. Nobody could sleep that night, and they waited in silence until the break of dawn. The first rays of sun made the fog slowly disperse, and the whole crew went to the edge of the deck with heavy hearts. There was still hope in them, until the last strands of the mist went away, revealing a vast, calm, and most importantly, empty ocean. The nameless schooner was gone, and so was the second team of the Ellen Austin sailors. The ship sailed the rest of the way to New York in grave silence. Once it arrived at the port, the passengers were only too happy to leave the vessel, and no one so much as turned their head as a goodbye. That was the ship's last voyage as the Ellen Austin. That same year, it was sold to a German shipping company and renamed Meta. No one ever found the derelict schooner or the sailors that went missing with it. And that would probably be the end of this mysterious and unresolved story, if it held at least a little bit of the truth. In reality, none of the enigmatic things in the narrative actually happened. The Ellen Austin did indeed leave Liverpool and headed southwest to New York, and its captain was really A.J. Griffin, taking people to the American continent. But from here, the story falls apart. First of all, the ship went way too far to the north to pass the Sargasso Sea so closely. There was simply no reason to make a detour so broad. Even though the westerly winds were strong, it was still faster to take them head-on than to go in a southerly direction. So the Ellen Austin was probably nowhere near the Sargasso Sea and the Bermuda Triangle. Secondly, 
The triangle itself has been proven time and again to be nothing but a work of fiction. In fact, it gained popularity in the middle of the 20th century, while nobody even thought of drawing a triangle in the Bermuda area before that. The mystery was popularized by science fiction writers and became a common myth, while no serious research proved it any more dangerous than other parts of the world's ocean. So the crew of the Ellen Austin weren't even aware of the Bermuda Triangle back then, let alone afraid of it. Thirdly, the whole story was told and retold by magazines and mystery-loving personalities with ever-changing details. It first appeared in a newspaper in 1906 and already had the date wrong. The article said the voyage took place in 1891 instead of 1881. Later, the story resurfaced in 1935 on the radio with the wrong name of the captain. It was Baker, not Griffin. The date was also off, saying the trip was taken in August 1881, when the Ellen Austin was already renamed Meta. The legend grew upon with other strange details, such as the ship's route from London to Newfoundland, which was never the case. But the final debunking came from the archives of Lloyd's of London, the marine insurance market that keeps all logs of trade and emigration ship routes. The documents there say that on February 1881, the Ellen Austin completed its cross-Atlantic voyage to New York without incident. Captain A.J. Griffin off-boarded the ship with all his crew hale and hearty and declared no loss of hands during the trip. The voyage took over two months because the ship had to fight strong westerly winds pushing it back towards Britain. The crew reported no strange encounters on the way, and the whole thing was as boring as could be. And even the passengers must have been smiling when they stepped on the American soil at last, unaware of the phony baloney story they were about to be a part of.